four, three, two, one. We're synced. Cool. Hello all and welcome to an, another episode of the most popular and only podcast in the world, Dick Proles, where we do the most with what little we have. Dick Proles, where all of the hosts, no matter their gender so far, all have a dick. Sorry, I had to. <laughs> I had to. I had it saved up for like months. <laughs> I literally had to. Oh my god, yes. Finally um, released. So yeah, this is, um, this is uh, Dick Proles, short for Dictatorship of the Proletariat. Well, hold on, um, I was going to get to that. Okay, go ahead. Well, so right off the bat, first, um, I li- off, I'd like to introduce the, the first guest, or the, uh, the first recurring host, or recurring character on this show, sitting opposite me, Olivia. Hello. Say hello to the to the world. Hello, I'm Olivia. It is nice to not meet you all freaks on the internet. And then um, now I'd like to introduce the the second guest sitting across from her, me. Hi everyone, I'm Evan. Um, and we're coming to you live from a, uh, a recording from one of the hottest local couches that we know of to ensure an authentic listening experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have slept on this futon while homeless, so it is, it, it's not technically a hot couch, but it's, it's definitely something. Mutual aid couch at the very least. A lukewarm futon, to be sure. <laughs> So, uh, I guess we've gotten through introductions, so then the first thing on our agenda today is, uh, what prompted this show? Um, I guess this show started as a dumb idea of mine, and, uh, the original name was gonna be Casual Conversations, but then I brought uh, it up. We decided would not be a very original name. Well, I I brought it up to all of you, and then you're all like, no, that's stupid, and I'm like... I like it. No, we have to have everything be a self-deprecating joke about penises. <laughs> you know, capitalism is when patriarchy is stored in the balls. We have so many taglines just waiting to happen. Yeah. Um, because dick no. proles at its core is all about the ways that we compensate for the ways that the political system makes us feel small, which means, uh, in my case, uh, being trans and intersex and lots of boxes being checked, making a lot of dick jokes about myself. <laughs> And um, I guess the the other big thing is the name. Now neither of us, right? You didn't come up with the name. I think Taylor did. Yeah, but I'm um, pretty so, sure Taylor did. It was outside AMS during clinic escorts at one point. So uh, we'd been throwing around a podcast name or concept since November. That's when I brought about, it up. Yeah, and, about, about after uh, I got broken up with. And the the name was up in the air for a long time. And then our friend, who you'll meet uh, in a later episode, we're not exactly sure when, Taylor, uh, he, we were doing some clinic escorts, which we'll get to. Um, Outside the abortion clinic in town, mm-hmm. shouldn't have clarified. And he, uh, yeah, he said dick proles apparently to you. And then either one of you brought it up in our group chat. And then, uh, like, all of us in the group chat were like, yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. Abso-fucking-lutely yes. And um, um, I guess part of, the exp- or part of this section was to explain the name, which comes from... Dictatorship of the Proletariat in, uh, mm-hmm. in the Marx, I believe, in books by Marx I haven't read, certainly. <laughs> Um, Illiterate. But uh, dictatorship in this uh, case doesn't mean like a rule by one man, just so you know. A little po- uh, political theory tip is that dictatorship in this case just means uh, it's about who's dictating how society runs. So it means that the proletariat, the workers, would get to run things and, uh, you know, more economic democracy, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of like Trump running the country, it would be. <coughs> Oh, Jesus. It would be... Uh, that is a really nice natty light for you there. Yeah. The... We are not sponsoring anybody. <laughs> Blur that out. <laughs> We're not being sponsored. Uh, the only thing I can say about this drink is, as it's Adam put disgusting. it, it is both very gay and very homophobic at the same time. If you can see the fucking... <laughs> maybe you know what I mean. <laughs> may, no, maybe... Uh, uh, I know um, I know we're getting a little off topic here, but That's fine. for like um, an image for this episode, I know that uh, uh, Discourse Collective one time, it was the Hegel episode, they were trying to figure out a, an idea for the image, and they're like, yo, one of them was like, yo, what if we just took Hegel and we flipped it so that Hegel was literally upside down? I see, my, my username on a lot of stuff is GWF Bagel, so like Hegel on a bagel, uh, and that's pretty fun for me. I read way too little Hegel in school, and now it broke my brain. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But, um, so that's the, 
the dictatorship of the proletariat is where the workers run everything, and that is where we got the name for this uh, this series because I'm a worker, she's a worker, and all the other they mer- everyone you well not everyone in but you people are you probably know who also. you are if you are a worker yep um, especially like. If you're one of those lower management types who's just like running the shift at the restaurant too, like you're a worker, you're definitely still a worker. Um, other things we wanted to mention, so the idea behind the show is to basically do like emotionally intense and vulnerable interviews about how people's lives basically get fucked up by the political system. Kind of uh, interviews from the lumpen proletariat, I think would be a good way to describe it, of uh, and people what who is- have had what yeah. is the lumpen proletariat people might be asking yeah so lumpen is this uh another kind of class category category uh from marxism which basically talks about the people left out of um left behind in society and marx views them as like the last people in the working class that have to be given up on because they're just uh stuck in whatever criminal or like informal market or uh outside the law uh, in some cases, they're the people who, because of their lack of uh, material stability, can't participate in the project for uh, like for winning freedom. So one of the things that we decided for this podcast is that we we don't leave people behind here. We don't think that lumpen is a good category to use, and we know a lot of people who have been in a lot of fucked up situations, ourselves included, and. Um, at least so far, I don't think we've had to give up on too many people. No. And so um, so some of you might be wondering, like, uh, who's some lumpen proletariat person that I might know? And I'm uh, homeless as shit right now. <clears throat> no, I was going to say, even better, going back to the absolute best TV show on the planet. Oh. Yeah. Ricky, Bubbles, and Julian. Super all lumpen the, proletariat. All from Trailer Park Boys. If you watch even the first episode of the series, they are all lumpen. They're all... Well, I mean, yeah. Bubbles is kind of an exception. They're all criminals. They're all poor as shit. They all live in a trailer park. Yeah, there's actually there's a really good article on libcom.org that this guy wrote about um, the first, I think, three or four seasons of Trailer Park Boys and talks about how um, drug dealing and, like, the infor- informal economy based on, like, petty thefts and just small crimes... Uh, is like the economic glue that holds a lot of society together. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would imagine that what we can say of Trailer Park Boys also applies, uh, you know, in neighborhoods of Milwaukee that, like, we've been told to avoid all our lives. And stuff like that. That's what this flag is, if you guys couldn't tell. Yeah, we're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I don't know what zip code we're in right now, but the last time I had a stable address, I was at 53215 on Milwaukee Southside, heavily Latino neighborhood. Um, If you don't know much about the city, it's at the confluence of two rivers, and those rivers basically determine where you live based on your race. It's one of the most segregated cities in America. Um, Yeah, it is the most segregated. I think there are I think there are different measures for it, but um, I mean, five three two zero six is the most incarcerated zip code in the country, and we are we our country has the highest incarceration incarceration rate of any other country on the planet, even 5 through 206 is one of the most probably dangerous places to live for like a poor person on the planet. Yeah, Milwaukee. Milwaukee's all sorts of uh, not good in yeah, terms of its, it's, uh, its goodness. <laughs> I, love the, I love this city with my whole fucking heart and it's been there for me in a million ways, but it is fucked up it's, and it, uh, it needs fixing. Yeah. And, needs fixing. And hopefully we'll, with this, not only here in Milwaukee, but uh, across the country and the state, we will uh, yeah. bring people together. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll probably never be as big as Street Fight Radio, but we do want to spread this mess across the U.S. Uh, if anyone is interested in that. <laughs> yeah. So the next thing that I had written down is uh, the political background for us two, because you might be wondering, like, who are these hot couch losers that are uh, trying to talk to me yeah. about... Uh, Who's about recording all... with blur- vertical blinds two feet away <laughs> oh, from <yeah>. them? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess then we'll get into the, qu- the interview, qu- interview questions about this. So uh, um, the first question that I had written down, which we'll probably be using for uh, anyone that comes on the show or some people on this show... Um, uh, what yeah. is your background slash label? So like, um, if you guys can Im- 
uh, I doubt that we'll have. Do you want to go first on that one? Potential. I I feel like my. <laughs> I feel like my answer will be able to bounce off yours pretty well. Um, I don't know if we'll have the the capabilities, like the editing, video editing capabilities, but uh, if we do, we'll put a little picture right here of the political chart. It, uh, it's four sections. Go. Oh, let's not do that. No. Let's do it another way. What does your like week to week look like in terms of like what your organizing is? What kind of projects you're working on? What? I like, what kind of things are you engaged in? That's a better question, I feel. <laughs> Internet crankery? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, he also came up um, with Milwaukee DSA. We're hoping to start up a harm reduction program to um, mm -hmm. uh, train people how to use naloxone, also known as Narcan. It uh, reverses opioid overdoses. Uh, Evan was uh, one of the main uh, guys behind that idea. It's something he's been working on. So seriously, stop selling yourself short. We're on a podcast. <laughs> um, so I guess my my political background or label, uh, if you look it up, the political compass, whatever. I don't know how much value that'll hold in this whole context, but yeah, I, what I would actually be interested to see what it says about you. Uh, I got libertarian socialist, which is okay. minus. It's in the bottom left corner. It's yeah, uh, that's really not narrowing down a ton. But, it's uh, in the smack dab of the bottom left corner, and uh -huh. um, imagine like. Gee, I don't know. So would you call yourself an anarchist or like against the state itself? Typically or, uh, that up. Uh, so one quick thing is in I mean, the you're repping the red and black. Yeah. And an upside down uh, blue lives matter flag. Yeah. It, so uh, yeah. Fuck blue lives. <laughs> we, am I right? <laughs> we're, we're not a fan of the, the police or the state here, but um, favorite number is 1312. Get that tattooed on my goddamn <laughs> forehead. Um, it's a big forehead. It'll fit. <laughs> But uh, in all the books that I've read, a quick aside here is that uh, people like us are the actual libertarians, and like the typical right wing in America, they co opt a bunch of uh, iconography and language. And the American libertarians, we will call propertarians because they're not the actual libertarians because they still believe in capitalism, which is oppression. Blah, blah, blah. We'll get onto yeah. that in another episode. And, and, uh, with any uh, right libertarian, you're going to find someone who cares about human rights, but really only the human right to, uh, you know, fuck 13-year-olds and, and, uh, and own property, yeah, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying we know anyone specifically, um, but uh, we know someone specifically. <laughs> There's some, we've met some weirdos out there. Yes, but yes we have. Um, aside from that... So um, you would describe yourself as a libertarian socialist then? I... You've told me, you've brought this up a lot of times. I have a, in all the stuff that I've read, which we will hopefully cover on this show, whatever, um, I have a hard time sticking to just a libertarian socialist label because there's a lot of stuff from the left side of the spectrum, like Marxist Leninism, uh, anarchism, true liber like classical libertarianism, communism, socialism that I, I identify with. So, Okay. Just a leftist, That's cool. I guess. Yeah, I um, I have a pretty similar answer. I, my politics, I just, I take a pragmatic route on that, and I don't mean pragmatic in the sense that I compromise on everything. I mean, um, pragmatic in the sense that I try and just take useful ideas or interesting things to do from wherever I can find them. Uh, so. I would describe my leftism as incoherent and intentionally so. I find often that being flexible and being vague about what I actually believe is most useful in terms of my day-to-day -day organizing. Like the harm reduction stuff we do is very mutual aid oriented. That's definitely in a libertarian socialist tradition, mm -hmm. maybe social <laughs> ecology tradition. But uh, I mean, I wouldn't say I've read a ton of books because I'm a really shitty reader but uh, influenced by people like uh, Chantal Mouffe radical like a radical radical democratic critique of the left uh, all the Leopold on environmentalism I studied some Buddhism in college and I'm white which means I'm not allowed to call myself a Buddhist because that's <laughs> stupid um, but it is um, very flexible and actually I could talk for hours about how Buddhist ethics follow very well from its metaphysics and how Buddhism is actually very flexible. Mm -hmm. um, but I would describe myself as an incoherent leftist specifically because I find strength in being vague and not making any commitments for myself because I know that my ideas are probably going to change within the next, like... Five minutes. <laughs> I was going to say 40 <laughs> seconds. Uh, yeah, I'm so ruthlessly committed to dialectics that I cancel myself every 40 seconds. Yes, I'm stealing that tweet from like three years ago. No, I will not apologize. 
Uh, I will never apologize for stealing tweet ideas because my Twitter sucks. <laughs> So the, every time I, Evan, how many times in the last few months have I gone on a tweet storm and then had a brain meltdown? Because either the, tweeting is the way I excise my personal trauma or it's a symptom of my personal trauma or both. Look, I can't count that high <laughs> and four is a big number, so. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't, don't worry about me. God, I'm a fucking idiot. It rules. So, <laughs> it's so cool, actually. I love being stupid. So Everyone then, just talks down to me all the time, and I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm just going to pretend like I understand and keep doing what I do. I'm an incoherentist leftist. It's totally a valid identity. So the next question that I had on here is, like, uh, what philosophers or politicians, whatever, have you Can read? I cut in for a second? Yeah, go for it. Just in terms of the valid identity thing, so... Um, I was assigned male at birth. I am uh, what you would call, to use all the adjectives, I'm a uh, gender fluid, non-binary, trans femme, which is a lot. So uh, non-binary as in my gender and my sex both don't fit on the binary. I was born with genes in the middle and that's about where I feel. Uh, on the feminine side of the middle, uh, non-binary as in, so not on either side of the spectrum, male to female. Uh, or man to woman, gender fluid in that, you know, I change my presentation according to what I need, which means, you know, I'm going to drop my voice and go hard mask when I'm at the mechanic shop, but uh, at a normal way of speaking, I try and raise it up a little bit. Um, I don't know how successful I am at that, but it's something I'm working on. Uh, so gender fluid in that, it changes minute to minute. Uh, and then trans, because I was assigned male at birth incorrectly, uh, and femme because I like the feminine side of things. So that's a lot of adjectives from one person's gender, so we can move on. <laughs> um, I guess before we depart also, you uh, point out my jacket a little bit ago for like what I identify as and yeah, that's a hell hat. of a jacket. My, can this I is, point out all the stuff on it? Yeah, and let me, let me complete the outfit. Okay, so. All right, let's go from uh, this, so, go from this side. So is that Tovarish on your back? What's the Russian? Oh, no. Um, so on the back, it's incomplete, but that's supposed to say uh, what is to be done. Okay. And then like on the, the Lenin tract? Yeah. The, okay. So then we have an anti-Blue Lives Matter because, upside down flag. Which we'll, we'll explain We don't have to episode. explain any of it right now. We're just going to go for it. The red and black for libertarian socialism, a crossed out control key for no control. Kind of anarchist. Uh, a Bernie, Milwaukee for Bernie's uh, pin. <laughs> right uh, next to a KGB honors pin. Which KGB really honors see. pin, and is that a, what it's, is the thing below it, a bird or something? It's like a weird horse thing that I got out of a, a jamboree, a Boy Scout jamboree, okay. whatever. Then uh, we got the, the hammer and sickle here. Ooh, we're another. just making a lot of sense. Yeah, then we got Cuba uh, Libre. Yeah, we got Cuba for uh, Latin Marxist Leninism. And then thirteen twelve, and then another Boy Scout thingy. Yeah, right? that's that's just Pedro. Are a you patch. wearing a Dolan shirt too? Oh yes. So uh, this is that's such an old meme. Who would have a Dolan shirt? That's so, so this dumb. is the band. This is about the band Periphery, which I really like. Uh, shout out to them. Uh, not sponsored by them or affiliated with them in any way, but I used to really like them and I still really like them. But uh, my friend got me this shirt for my birthday uh, in like 2013, and I'm like, oh my god, I love this shirt so much. And uh, yeah, <laughs> can I describe my outfit? Now we're getting into like hashtag best dress videos. Well, I'll, I'll describe yours since you kind of describe mine. Yeah, um, go for it. So as you can see here, she is wearing a, a Gucci shawl. This is not Gucci. No, okay, <laughs> no. fuck off. So this it, is all from Nordstrom Rap. Not all of it. Thrift stores and Nordstrom Rap with the pants. Um, I try and wrap the red and black for left unity. I also really just like the color burgundy. Uh, it also makes me feel like royalty. And I once traced my ancestry back like 500 years to uh, a dumb little fort. Yeah, this dumb little fort somewhere <laughs> in uh, Alsace-Lorraine, right? Which means my uh, family was once nobility, and uh, if you want to talk about downward nobility, talk to me. <laughs> $100,000 in student loan debt. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, like a good leftist, uh, she's wearing synthetic de- sin- denim. Synthetic denim. jewelry, because oh. you don't need conflict minerals to enjoy yourself. True. But uh, then, yes, like a good leftist, she's wearing denim. And if you want to show the audience what's on the back of your jacket, I think the, uh, a lot of oh, yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of people that might be listening in would like this. We have the, uh, the trans uh, identity uh, symbol here, which is... Minus this little hammer right here. That's essentially what it is. And then, uh, yeah, we got the hammer and sickle there, as you can see. So it's uh coolest jacket I own. It, yeah. How much was this at the thrift store that we found this at? Do you uh, know? Five bucks. Yeah, <laughs> my favorite piece of clothing right now. <laughs> so then never is... let anyone. Don't ever let a rich person tell you you can't have style when you're poor. Fashion is for people with too many clothes. Style is for people who know how to put an outfit together on a cheap budget. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the I last, will always believe that. The last thing about my outfit is this little uh, Hershey's hat, which you have labeled as brand fetish- fetishization. It is. Uh, we're going to leave that off now because also, that's Mister Also, Mr. talks down to women about, hey, have you read Baudrillard oh, at a party? Up. Shut up. No, dude, I was on mushrooms that night, and I was more in control than you. Oh, whatever. You were so drunk. I was not. At the start of the party, you were. You came down. Whatever. You came down by the time you had to drive. Like, you were very sober by then because we stayed so incredibly late, which is good, <laughs> kids. Yeah. That, kids, first advice, if you're ever out drinking... Don't fucking drive. Just wait till you're sober. Sleep it off. Doesn't matter. Don't wake up in a drunk tank. Don't wake up in a ditch. Don't wake up with drunk driving charges. You don't want that. It's not good. Not at all. If it feels like the party is still moving, you cannot drive. I promise. So the next... Finally getting back on topic. (laughs) Um, The next thing that I had on the list is what kind of... uh, Essentially, who have you read? And who do you like? Uh, do you want me to go first on that? Yeah, you can go first. What? I'm not going to talk about people who I've read because I haven't read that much. I will talk about people who have influenced me, though. Okay. Um, so I've been reading a lot since January, like a good dumb anarchist. I'm so <laughs> dumb that I'm actually reading. <laughs> Make it up for it. Really Maybe. owning myself, actually. I mean, I can tell the difference, though. I, I have gotten a lot less dumb over the past seven months. Um, so, like, uh, just a bunch of random books from uh, Verso. Like, we got Alt America, we got Against Creativity. Um, but for, like, some of the more notable names that a lot of people might know, um, got uh, Che Guevara here. I've read The Motorcycle Diaries. Hunter S. Thompson, which, believe it or not, he was, like... Hunter Thompson. He was, a, he was a dirtbag leftist before dirtbag leftists were a thing. Yeah, Real got, good boy. Real pro-gonzo hours. Everyone <sighs> better be up because it's the daytime and I'm awake, which means everyone's up probably that we know. Yeah, and then I've I've read uh, a little bit of Rosa, Karl Marx, and Friedrich Engels, obviously. Rosa Luxembourg? Luxembourg. Yeah. Okay. Um, got some Daniel Guerin on here for my anarchism. So you keep a spreadsheet of everything you've been reading? Yeah. Nice. With, uh, how long, like, when I started, when it ended, and then also the topics that are covered. Nice. So if anyone's That's ever good. like, hey, what can I read yeah, on this use, topic? Be like, I go. use my little logbook to do something similar. I take notes when I read. And then I got the real brain-breaking stuff of Jean Baudrillard in the System of Objects, which broke my brain for a little bit. Yeah, um, I love Babby's first French theory. Then we got Thomas Sankara, <laughs> because he's a good boy. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, obviously. Emma Goldman, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Gamal Gamal Abdel Nasser, I'm pretty sure. I'm not 100% Yeah, because I I got that. I uh, I got that from uh, PragerU, actually, so I'll take anything they say with a grain of salt. Yeah, uh, I'll talk more about this when we get into my Uh, section. Yeah, and then I'm going to be reading, like, Guy Debord, uh, who else? Is it Debord? Debord. French? He's French, yeah. Okay. And then, like... Yeah, uh, you would understand more about reading French than me. And then uh, I'm also going to be reading some Henry Lefebvre, some Gandhi, uh, Peter Kropotkin, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Mao Zedong, and some Kim Il-sung later this year. Cool. So it's a nice spread. Yeah, and um, I will say, so on my side of it, uh, I got to study... Um, political theory in college that doesn't mean I was doing all the readings when I was supposed to um, and I I would call myself like self-taught but that's really pretentious and stupid I actually I would say I've gotten most of my political like awakenings in life via like passive learning via the internet um, so when I was in like seventh grade I figured out um, not only was I 
leaving behind conservatism, but I was leaving behind um, my religious faith. I don't come from a super intensely religious family. Um, I would left behind my faith. I left behind thinking I was straight. Um, I low-key discovered I was trans when I was like 13 uh, or so, 12, 13. <laughs> you um, kind of brushed that under the rug. <laughs> yeah, I, I brushed that part under the rug because I thought, oh, I'm just bi for a while. Um, <laughs> Wanting to dress as a woman? Eh. Yeah, no, I actually, I, uh, when I was like 12 or 13, I saw this interview with a trans woman. I remember very specifically thinking um, almost every day since then, like, wow, if I would have had the option, I would probably be a lesbian. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, and then I just proceeded to never analyze that thought for like eight years. Um, I really rolled the dice on being intersex. I transitioned very quickly, um, which is fun. Uh, and I have been enjoying it a lot uh, because gender euphoria is a thing and dysphoria isn't the only part of being trans. It's actually really wonderful and beautiful if you let it be. And in this um, moment, are you euphoric? Yeah, shut up. Um, but so I would say major uh, people that have influenced me was like back in my YouTube atheism days, I was a huge, like amazing atheist head. So uh, I'm hoping all two of our listeners don't get that joke because he was like <laughs> very strongly anti-feminist and I'm very strongly feminist. Um, so I watched, um, in terms of the Jamal Abdel Nasser thing, uh, I took a lot of Coursera classes when I was bored in like high school, not so much in college. Uh, and then from there, I would say I'm very influenced by um, American pragmatism, the philosophical school, all truth is just use value, um, which, you know, has implications that we could talk about more, but generally I just view the right thing to do as like what happens to produce the best results in any given situation. I'm very utilitarian in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I also find that like, we can have more episodes on like ethics too, because I was paying attention in school even though I wasn't doing the readings like I should have. <laughs> um, but very influenced by care ethics, um, Buddhist social engagement and ethics, stuff like that. Um, again, I'm not going to call myself a white Buddhist because that's low-key, high-key colonial in a lot of ways. And I am extremely white. <laughs> um, so I don't know that I need to co-opt that, but I would say those are like the biggest influences on me. And then I am um, Aldo Leopold, like social ecology stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if actually social ecology would be the right term for it, but um, Aldo Leopold, San County Almanac, best book in the English language that I've read so far. And I haven't read much, which means that uh, <laughs> you should listen to my very sparse uh, recommendations. <laughs> yeah, I, I've read one page of Aldo Leopold, and he's really good. I really like it. Team it turns out if you only read the conclusion of every book you read, you get the gist of it. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm too stupid for anything else. Are you kidding me? My brain was broken by the internet. I can only tweet when I'm reading. So I guess this kind of, you kind of covered it, but um, the sub point to that is what favorite political or philo philosophical media have you consumed? Um, since we're obviously dirtbag leftists and leftists, uh, Chapo Trap House and Street Fight Radio. Are you a big, uh, are you big into like bread tube people like Natalie Wynn? Um, ContraPoints? She's real good. Do you Check watch uh, H-Bomb at all? No, I've kind I, of been meaning to. I don't really like H. Bond. I mean, he's fine. He did that great charity mm -hmm. uh, run for trans people. I just don't find his videos that interesting. Um, but he's a great guy by all counts. Uh, other other plugs I have for a lot of bread tube people. Um, Thought Slime. He does really good videos that are reasonably funny, reasonably entertaining. Um, I've recently been watching Vosh. He's real dirtbag left. He's real funny. He does like hour long videos dissecting an eight minute PragerU video. It's insane. Um, I love shit like that. He's so that, no, that's actually like passive learning is what I do because I like, <laughs> I have to be distracted like on all fronts. So I'm usually like, all right, second screen is gonna be like some sort of passive learning thing and then I'll be gaming on the other one. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's an episode that we can do is like what sort of- Why gaming is evil and should be abolished. <laughs> Look, you can't abolish the value form unless you abolish gaming first. And just remember, in the words of Thomas Sankara, the revolution cannot succeed without the, the, deliberation, the deliberate suppression of gamers. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Gaming sucks, I love it. It's so stupid, but I love it. <sighs> Who are some other left two people? I, I'm sure there's more, but we'll do an, a whole episode yeah. maybe dedicated to that at some point I'm in the future. I'm more on the podcast front, so uh, strong recommendations for Street Fight Radio. Uh, everyone already knows what Chapo Trap House is. Um, I'd also say Season of the Bee, uh, specifically their episodes on uh, dialectical materialism, 
and the occupation of Palestine, really fantastic. Um, season of the Beat goes over my head a lot, though. I'm like way too dumb to be listening to them. Like they'll say something about like, oh, you have to think about this in this way, and I'll be like, wait, but what's the second word? And you're still talking. Please help. <laughs> um, so yeah, massive props to Season of the Bee. Um, love Dumb Bitch Media lately. It's super funny. Uh, two Canadian comedians. Is that the people that interviewed Brett and Brian? No, that was no, that's Girls Chat. They're like the really irony poisoned ones. <laughs> I'm not sure if they're canceled, but they did have like. They, I think it's a joke to like bait men into like showing their ass because in the Brett and Brian one, like you could tell the Kratom dads were just getting super uncomfortable with all the sex questions. And the, like their previous guest before that was, I think, like John McAfee or something. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. John McAfee's a real weirdo. Yeah, girls' chat is a little too irony poison for me. I am obviously in no position to cancel anybody given how white and bougie I am, but. Uh, you know, I guess if you want to cancel me, that's okay. <laughs> that's kind of just the dialectic moving itself forward, I guess. Um, the next question that I had is what politi political philosophers... Oh, also, wait, one more thing. I am stupid on dialectics. I will never stop talking about that. It's one of the only concepts in philosophy I actually fully understand. No, I don't fully understand it. That I even partially understand. But you really like it, and it's kind of apparently helped you a little bit. It's helped me a lot. It's the most useful way to see the world. Dialectical material. Reading street signs as a site of surplus extraction rather than merely traffic law. Um, I have gotten a few tickets, but they were mostly the fault of me not having my registration because of the move I recently had. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm able to find pre free parking pretty easily now because I can read signs. <laughs> And yeah, the fact that I had to learn dialectics to read signs probably says more about me than signs, but anyway. <laughs> so the next question uh, that I had is, what political philosophers have you really liked and who has influenced you the most? I, since we've already listed a lot, I would, I would say narrow it down to one, but I have two answers in my head. Go ahead. So I, for my two favorite political philosophers, I would have to pick uh, Vladimir Lenin, I've only read The State and Revolution currently, but oh, it's so good. The imperialism, we'll, the highest stage is better, I feel. We'll be doing a, a reading series, hopefully, on both of those, and then also in one of the soon episodes, we're going to be uh, analyzing like power structures. And State and Revolution is, I would say, a must read for like any leftist. Yeah, maybe. I, I've, I never finished it, so <laughs> I can't recommend any must read. I can't recommend any must-reads. What I would say, though, is um, I TA'd for this guy named Farhang or Fani once. Uh, look up his name on YouTube and listen to his lectures about political theory because they're really good. Um, that's another like good way to learn, too, is um, if you want to just like find academics who research interesting things, usually you can find conference stuff on um, YouTube or what have you. Uh, also, a big fan of Greg Sadler. He also lives in Milwaukee, does um, philosophy videos. Um, Philosophy Tube is a big thing on BreadTube for me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, his video on suicide is actually incredibly beautiful. Have you watched it? Uh, Philosophy Tube? Yeah. No. Okay, I would suggest it. It's really good. Very well produced, very well argued, as usual. Yeah. So then my second uh, favorite leftist, I would have to say, that I've uh, consumed so far is Daniel Guerin, whom I've mentioned a couple times. He's, interestingly, he's how I got my anarchist side. And then, uh, interesting that I mention Lenin and an anarchist in the same phrase as two people I really like. I think it's uh, really dialectical, as okay. you might say. <laughs> but um, yeah, Guerin, uh, an Anarchism from Theory to Practice, uh, really good. Also, I've not read it, but people say uh, con 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 Conquest speak. of Bread. The Conquest by, of Bread uh, by, by Kropotkin is a really good one. Potkin or Popkin? Do you know? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. Brian. But so yeah, Guerin and Lenin are probably my two favorite people that I've read so far. I would say uh, Chantal Mouffe. Uh, she writes about. She's one in, in like the radical democracy strain of like quote unquote post Marxism, which I don't really know what that means. It just means you have um, to clean your room. But she she talks about uh, basically there was this guy Nazi philosopher named Carl Schmidt who basically said that all politics is. Um, distinguishing like the uh, friend in group from the enemy out group and then destroying your enemies 
So uh, MOOF refines that for a more liberatory thing for leftists, which basically says there's not a friend enemies distinction. Uh, there's a friend uh, adversary and enemy distinction where um, you have to be able to point out the difference between who is like a legitimate opposition to you uh, and then from there determine who must be like kept out of the political process and who like which opinions are legitimate to have around. So like fascism is not like that would go in the enemy camp mm -hmm. firmly, whereas like Social Democrats, because they can be pulled left, would probably be closer to adversaries. Yeah, I, uh, a lot, probably a good amount of liberals too would be in adversaries. Um, but like, once you get far enough on the deep end, it's like a way of solving like that quote unquote paradox of tolerance, is like being able to, through having, vague beliefs, and vague messaging key, which is key, um, being able to like stay, flexible in what you're doing. I think if anything, I would say flexibility is like the one thing that guides my political praxis. Mm -hmm. And a quick thing to note, uh, she just said liberal. Uh, we're not talking about people like us. We're not liberals. So uh, liberals. Liberal as in um, any, uh, the way I was taught it is that a political thought system is liberal if it uses the uh, like human individual as the fundamental unit of politics, right? So what that eventually means in practice is like the evolution of like human rights but when it comes to enforcement it's always property rights mm -hmm. if that makes sense it, i guess a way to put that in american terms is like i believe in the constitution and yeah. what the constitution yeah, says yeah. is so, law so if you are um if you're like sworn into the u.s congress you're literally in some way a liberal because you are swearing to uphold a liberal document which mm -hmm. is what the constitution is mm -hmm. So, I guess that's good enough for that one. Yeah, what's uh, next? So the next this is, is taking longer than I thought, which means it can be a whole episode. So the next thing I had on here is, where do you think you used to be on the political compass, or where do you uh, think you used to be in like your political standings overall? Because I know you said that you used to be, uh, I don't know. I think, well, I, I think, used to be a little bit of everything. Honestly, speaking, if you don't, we've, if, we've all been a little bit more conservative so, when we were younger. Yeah, I mean, conservative now is like, or conservative when we were growing up leads into like something resembling Christian fascism in America today, especially in the like fucking third wing suburb, third ring suburb that we grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely started my life as a conservative, like a heavy conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, but I abandoned that pretty much in high school, I would say. Yeah, I think I, I would consider myself, I used to, I guess, be. Uh an American libertarian or like a, a, a propertarian as yeah, I will. Everyone has that phase. Yeah, we like, it, it used to be, you know, typical, oh, America's the greatest. I love America. And then as I've gone, I've been shifting more and more, to, well, in your, your guys' way, I've been shifting more and more left. But um, yeah, uh, I on used that to. that four part political chart though, honestly, I can get, scoring in the red section in the quote-unquote authoritarian left, I can understand that. If you end up on the right side of that spectrum at all, you're kind of, like, I, I fundamentally don't understand you. And frankly, if you don't end up somewhere in the green for those test questions, then I am honestly worried about, like, your capacity to feel empathy towards other people. And that's something, too, that I, um, I think in the the episode where we look at like power and whatnot we might go into the political spectrum a little bit more but we'll definitely go into it more in a later episode or we'll find some other sources on who might have dissected it more because that's kind of important that uh not only us but everyone understands the the whole spectrum of political ideologies and what they all mean at their core and what kind of tendencies that will uh mean that people follow yeah the goal here is to um to uh, instead of going from the abstract to the concrete, we're gonna try and ground all of our abstract political thinking that we've been talking about just now in uh, people's everyday experiences, um, like using people's experiences to point out things in political theory. Because uh, if your political theory doesn't correspond to how things actually are for people, then it's not just unhelpful, but it's wrong. Yeah, it's empirically wrong. If you're Specifically, I would say if if you're one of those um, like really 
hardcore French theorist who ends up thinking, oh, we're all defeated, that there's no hope. Um, if your political ideology ends with anything other than action, then be, by default it is wrong. As in, it's not a political ideology, it's the absence of one, because if it doesn't guide your actions, um, it's not doing anything functionally. I can't believe I forgot that. That yeah. was one thing that, I mean, I think I was the one that was like, yeah, we need to focus on this for the podcast. I can't believe I forgot that. Thank you for uh, bringing that up again. Yeah, and I, I think the thing is too, that's one of the things that actually gives me hope for the future is that fascists in this country are growing day by day, but the thing is, they're also like growing wide in a certain way. Like they are very generally like lazy people who don't know how to fight, who don't know how to gather their own resources. Like if it came down to it, I very, very much doubt that the kind of like growing right wing, like violent right wing would be able to not only outnumber the left, but outfight the left, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I don't think that we need to call for street violence because most fascists in this country are just fascists who watch Fox News and don't do anything except vote. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't to say that voting is the only thing you can do for um, politics. No. It's really the bare minimum. Uh, but what I will say is that if your practice is limited to voting, then you've kind of limited how much power you can wield in life, mm -hmm. I would say. And yeah. I also, I say this as someone who uh, has a pretty extensive history working in electoral politics itself, and I have a lot of mixed feelings about that that I would be willing to talk about later, but um, don't call me a bougie electoralist because, yeah, I'm bougie, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. I am homeless right now. <laughs> But that's okay. We're getting out of it. So then the last question that I had in the brief question segment is, uh, what is your biggest political slash philosophical hang-up? Why has everyone got to be so pissed at me all the time? <laughs> Ser no, seriously, like, people are just, like... Because you're a paid I'm, plant, obviously. Yeah, no, like, I <laughs> have been accused of being a paid plant for an organization I haven't draw a, drawn a salary with in over... In three years. Over a year. Oh, yeah. Uh, so some guy accused me of being a paid plant from some place I used to work at, which was really disheartening uh, for a while. But um, trying to let bygones be bygones, uh, trying to be nice about it, um, trying to be patient with people. People have a lot of very understandable reservations about, <clears throat> excuse me, about electoral politics, which as someone who's worked in electoral politics, I get that. Um, it's frustrating and it's slow and you don't ever get what you want really um, But it's also not something I think I would foreclose off for myself if that makes sense mm -hmm. And for, for me, me to talk more I need to I, I'm losing my voice a little bit so Oh good because we're pretty close to being done um, for my biggest good. political or philosophical hang-up Jeez, uh, there's so many well <clears throat> not so many but I have quite a few on both the left side and the right side, um, I don't know. I guess I'll pick one from each. My biggest left hang-up is as I've been reading uh, like Lenin and how how interestingly in the State and Revolution he's like, yes, the the dissolution or the withering away of the state is inevitable after the revolution, and that is going to happen. But then you yeah. look at the US, then you look at the USSR and what happened with the Bolsheviks, and it's like. Uh, well, a very, um, a very wise man named James Stam once said to me that, uh, you know, Lenin was a philosopher, uh, Stalin decidedly was not, <laughs> um, and uh, I don't think we have to be, you know, standing Stalin or apologizing for him to recognize, like, okay, you can't analyze the Soviet Union outside the context of, like, global U.S. and capitalist hegemony and stuff, mm -hmm. and imperialism, but also... Um, Lots of dead bodies. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't think we need to dismiss all those dead bodies exactly no. to point out that like they are the result of imperialism and like primitive accumulation or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess in that regards, to put it, since you brought up Stalin, uh, broad spectrum, I would... Uh, I'm not a Stalinist. Yeah, I was, we're I was not gonna, Stalinists. I was going to say, we're not, we're not Stalinists. Um, I'm also we're not apologizing for what Stalin did. I'm not apologizing for, for what Mao did. Or, we're not apologizing. Uh, Kim Sung, we're or, not apologizing for literally anyone that isn't ourselves, at least at the moment. I will apologize for the Iraq War. Uh, I don't. 
In terms of like those national wars of security, something that really guides me, another hang up I would say is anti-imperialism. Like, I don't think that the guilt of our imperial fucking blood, like blood-soaked imperialism can really be washed out unless we recognize how we benefit from it, including like whenever I get gas that's less than $3 a gallon, you know? like that's either a res result of fracking or imperialism or both, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to deny my part in that. So then I guess my, bringing that all together, my biggest hang-up of the left is the, the super authoritarian <laughs> communism. What you saw with the Soviet Union post-1920, and like the Stalin regime, and Like and the new all economic that. plan, or... J I don't know the, enough Soviet history, and I honestly... <laughs> That's another hang-up I have, is, like, you shouldn't have to know parts of, like, everything about Soviet history in order to have a valid opinion, I feel. Like, mm -hmm. there are lots of smart people who, if you just ask questions long enough, are going to get something towards radical politics without needing to know theory. Mm -hmm. um, our friend Coda, good yeah. example of that, um, there's someone we might be interviewing um, on audio eventually, um, but Coda's really smart, and I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of her, and she uh, slash they they don't need to read theory if they don't want to and mm -hmm. we don't either I want to because like I want to get better at what I do but it's not required I don't think at least I hope not if it is required then I guess we're fucked and there's no hope <laughs> so my, but my then I guess I'd be wrong because my, saying there's no hope means you're wrong yeah so my biggest left hang up is uh, like the state capitalism what happened with the Soviet Union and all that and then another hang up I have is the whole like typical American politics idea of guys, let's let's bring bring together the two sides. We can compromise. As you've said before, politics. We'll get into this later more in the power episode. But politics comes down to who can eat and who can't. Um, people like us saying that everyone can live and everyone can eat versus uh, the people on the right who are like, you know, wouldn't that be cool if we just buried all black people in a ditch? There's no compromise there. So I. I'm not willing to compromise with fascists. Yeah. I'll say it. Uh, that's my hang-up, is I, I don't think there's a compromise between everyone can eat and uh, some yeah. people deserve to die. The, the, I think there's a phrase in um, a few languages that aren't English that kind of goes like, um, if I've eaten, then you've eaten. So if you haven't eaten, then I shouldn't be eating, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that like really guides how I act. Um, like having had to... Um, I've gotten the luxury of having couches to sleep on and begging for money online, but um, I, you know, Milwaukee's one of the only cities where if you walk around long enough and you're homeless, someone actually might buy you a meal, mm -hmm. um, which is why you call it meal walk key, because walking around, <laughs> walking around can be the key to getting a meal in this city, and I don't know enough about the actual, like, indigenous origins of the name, because... Uh, you know, native genocide, but um, that's what Milwaukee means to me. Funny that At you least. say that. Actually, um, there is a perfect way to learn about the, the origins of the word Milwaukee. Uh, guess where from? What? Wayne's World. <laughs> Not even joking. Because um, in Wayne's World, they come to Milwaukee. I know they from, have like, the Chicago. Socialist, um, no, they, um, they come to joke. Milwaukee to see Alice Cooper. And they meet Alice Cooper afterwards, and they're talking with him. He's like, yeah, I'm really glad I come to Milwaukee. Which, actually, if you look in the history of the word Milwaukee, it's Milwaukee, which is Algonquin for the good land. Oh, it's Algonquin? Yep. Oh, that makes sense. See, I actually once spent, like, three hours after way too many bong loads trying to figure out the etymology of this place to try and, like, figure out, okay, who was... Who is living on this stolen land that I'm currently sleeping on? And I wasn't able to find it very much that was specific. But it, it is an Algonquin word. Yep. Interesting. I want because isn't Algonquin like a family of languages too? I haven't done enough looking into okay. my native history well, around here. Yeah, that's exactly it. Is that which is too, something we should do? Yeah, it, it is something we should do, and that's another thing about like just information and who's allowed to get it, whose account is decided to be correct is usually. The account of whoever is, you know, whoever has the biggest class. stick. Yeah, exactly. It's the reason why Teddy Roosevelt was loved for like doing imperialism, and because he was an outdoorsman when he did it. Like yeah. it's ridiculous. 
I think that uh, wraps up the question part then. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed our intro episode. This well, is very unprofessional so far, but we're going to try and do better each time. Well, uh, we've got a, well, I mean, we're at like 48 minutes. I don't know. I think we can cut it here. Okay, because I had 2020 DNC and all that. We can save that for another time, I guess. I guess we could, um, we could talk about current events a little bit. So uh, the DNC is coming in 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, back in uh, one of my more recent paid politics jobs, I had the uh, splendid fortune of helping to do some of the research that went into that proposal, uh, specifically calling up hotels and asking, like, how many rooms do you have? Uh, so partially responsible for that. Uh, conventions can be really bad for a city's local economy in terms of, like, harm to sex workers, harm to service workers, like people having to work extended hours, Mm -hmm. um, and then police militarization that usually endures after the convention, which Uh is something I'm really not looking forward to. I bet MPD is going to get a big gush of money from this, and uh, I'm not looking forward to see what they buy with it. Yeah. Not at all. And then I know... um, Cops scare me. (laughs) I've heard that apparently they're going to be building a... I don't know the exact number, but they're building a bunch of hotels for the convention. I believe that. Which they're going to be putting up, I, I would assume, that. starting at the end of this year, early next year, because it's in like July next yeah, year. Yeah, because when I was doing the research into it, I remember um, specifically at the company I was at, um, which I won't name because I think I might be breaking the law if I do, uh, but I remember specifically that I didn't finish the project of finding out how many like hotel rooms were ballparks for the area, and then some other intern hired after me probably had to finish that project, because um, I was only on the very, very like initial stage of gauging how many hotel rooms they were, and you know the people upstairs were the ones making decisions about that, you know. But the point is, is that we're we're going to be building. Uh, this isn't the right number, I think, but let's say half a dozen hotels, which are going to be here for the convention, which are probably going to be stuffed, and then. We don't yeah. probably don't fill the hotels around here anyways. Yeah. So these hotels I hope they're are not either... taking down any like already in use housing stock for that either. Like, that's do you know if they're eminent domaining anything for that? I don't know, but that'd, that'd be something that we can look into. Yeah, we should. And then also possibly yeah, mobilizing should. like against that afterwards. Do we have any other like local news um, you want to talk about? I know you had that uh, one person who died. I. I had a bunch of stuff about that that saved on my computer at home. Um, I guess we can talk about it a little bit. So in, I think it was Washington. Um, Washington guys, State? State, yeah. yeah. Um, out west. Yeah, it's out west at the very least. Um, so there was reports the other day of someone who shot, and th- shot at some vans that were going into an ICE detention facility and, some, uh, and threw, like, Molotov cocktails at a van. And they were shot dead by the police. And they actually left some, some writings, which I, I thought I would have with me that I could possibly read yeah. from. I, read, uh, I only read like three pages of it. There's apparently more, but I'll try to find that. Maybe I'll add a little annotation at the end yeah. of this where I read some of it. But yeah. they were an anarchist that read um, part of their, uh, their alias. Uh, their name They're an was old bomb-throwing anarchist. Kind of. Emma, Emma Durudi was the alias that they used. The first half of that Emma is from Emma Goldman, one of the, one of the philosophers that they read. She was an anarchist. Do you think it might be Darity, like as in solidarity? No, Durudi was, they were, they were a Spanish anarchist. Okay. But, um, so this person was a big anarchist, and, uh, yeah, they, they've died for freeing, trying to free some concentration camp prisoners. Yeah, I would say, too, like, obviously, um, acts of resistance against our genocidal border policies are always to be lauded and um, I hope this person you know can rest in power or peace or whatever they want Um, Mm -hmm. I would also say though please do not burn down or bomb detention facilities or shoot at them yeah that have um, refugees in them Uh, I think that's I mean obviously this person should rest in power but you, you have to be able to critique things as this like in any time kind of politics, doing things alone is never a good idea. Um, mm-hmm. Doing things with people, um, especially in ways where you're not going to get yourself or law enforcement hurt, because the unfortunate fact is that the more direct your challenge to the state is, the harder that they're going to hit back. Mm-hmm. And um, I think Emma found that out, unfortunately. So um, 
Mm -hmm. But rest in power, obviously. Yeah. Um, and we're rest not gonna... in power to anybody who opposes this genocidal border policy. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to call for people to take up arms and go shoot at cops and whatnot, but like, there are obvious steps that we need to take in order to resist the act that these people are doing. Yeah. And what those yeah. are right now, I, I'm, I'm not... sure that we know them in our heads, but like, we, we can't put legal them out right aid now. Is, legal aid, at least for now, is a major one. Mm -hmm. um, RACES, uh, R-A-I-C-E-S. Um, I don't know exactly what it stands for, but I believe it's a legal aid thing for um, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, immigrants. Um, I think uh, I've been told that they're a good place to donate to. I don't know enough about the issue to know really what um, an effective form of like uh, of pro of like fighting against this is. I don't have all the answers, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's got to be an answer somewhere because this shit cannot continue to happen. Yeah, and if someone, someone tells, tells you that they're, they're not concentration camps and that this isn't happening, they're wrong. They're yeah, just wrong. Just shoot them down. They're wrong. They are absolutely wrong. Concentration camps are not just what happened in Nazi Germany. They're designed to separate populations so that they can be treated however the ruling class wants to treat them. Mm -hmm. And in this case, that means throwing them in detention centers where kids are going to be traumatized for a lifetime or they will die mm -hmm. and, and their that's... parents will not know where their children are and I mean you want to talk about a material or concrete grounding um, that's not something that needs to happen to anybody no these whole border idea the idea of really fixed borders has not always existed in fact it's a very recent historical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have them. We didn't even have uh, ICE uh, until after... 2003. Yeah, it was 2003. the Patriot Act that inspired ICE, or that created ICE. Yeah, yeah. and same with, um, same with Homeland Security. Um, like, mm -hmm. DEA, ICE, Homeland Security, none of these things have to exist. People have lived without them for most of human history, mm -hmm. um, and they can live without them again. It's just... A matter of getting there. A quick aside, um, one th interesting thing that I noticed, or one interesting that, thing that I've read, uh, Hunter Thompson actually pointed this out to me. Um, out of the 100 people, is it Congress or the Senate that has 100 people? Senate. So in the Senate, there's 100 people, and the Patriot Act was voted yes by 99 I'm going to grab some more water real quick. You can keep talking, though. Do you know, who, and, and they'll be able to hear you, uh, do you know who the one person who voted no or who didn't vote yes on uh, the Patriot Act was? Tell me it was uh, Grandpa Bernie? No, um, out of the 100 people. Oh, in the Senate? Yeah. I don't know. Who? Russ Feingold. Oh, Who was a Wisconsin uh, senator. Yeah. And that was only because he didn't read it, or he didn't fully get through it. But, Jesus. That, okay, that's another thing, too, about reading. Like, if you feel like you have to read the full text of some legal document or some congressional bill up for vote to understand it, that's childish and stupid. You don't need to read everything to understand things. And the Patriot Act was, this is probably like an inch and a half, but it was probably like that thick. So, she thick. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess the last thing that I had on the agenda is what is the purpose of this whole thing? We've explained it a little bit where it's going to be emotional interviews and talking like this about different topics around us. It's connecting and, fucked situations to fucked political realities. I yeah, think. it's... I, I've said it as class consciousness. It's just making people aware of the situation that we're living in through various storytelling ways. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe that. Mm -hmm. So we'll be doing uh, YouTube videos, as some of you will see here. Um, a lot, of, and then we're hopefully gonna like do audio releases too. Yeah. So like this, the audio that's on here will be ripped and put on like Spotify and SoundCloud and all that. Wherever you get your podcast, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And then other things that we were hoping to do, I brought this up earlier. Uh, we want to do reading series, like dissecting or reading books, uh, like State and Revolution is one. Um, yeah, reading series specifically, reading, um, reading theory in full so mm -hmm. that uh, you don't have to, so that you can, um, one of the things I'm working on currently is uh, doing an annotation to one of the um, Hackett published uh, Platonic Dialogues, the Laches. It's um, about, my annotations are gonna be about Platonic Dialectics and how that works um, as part of a like longer educational scheme of getting towards like what dialectics actually means as a concept, how you can use it in politics, stuff like that. Um, so the goal, at least for that project on my end, is to read to be able to perform the whole dialogue 
uh, and then add in annotations mm -hmm. um, so that y'all can hopefully understand it better than I do, which is to say uh, having a very basic understanding of it. <laughs> so um, I don't think there's really anything else that we were planning on doing currently or that we have like ready to go in the yeah. works. Yeah, I think this is good right now. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Dick Prol is the only show, at least so far, where all the guest hosts have a dick, no matter their gender. Um, we're going to be talking about all the ways that we compensate for feeling small in the world, and uh, hopefully we'll learn something along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be back soon with some more content. Uh, keep posted. Stay tuned. Yeah, we were hoping to go like once keep a week. Keep posted and keep posting. Never log off. Never, ever fucking log off. My brain has been broken by the internet. You want me to hit the camera? Well, I think you had, um, you had a closing statement that you wanted to say. Did I? I think yeah, I... it was... Uh, Stay safe on these mean streets, right? Oh, yeah, stay safe out there. And then uh, keep fighting the good fight, everyone. Yeah, lots of sign-offs apparently here. Um, but yeah. uh, thank you for listening, and hopefully we'll talk at you soon. See you all later.